Okay. So now, you know, we, we're at the point of the audit where we, at this point, um, we've assessed control risk, we've assessed inherent risk, and kind of designed our audit approach, so the nature, timing, and extent of the audit work that we're going to do. And so we're in the phase of the audit where we're now collecting audit evidence. And so the, the approach that audit firms take to auditing financial statements is to break those financial statements down into the relevant uh, business cycle. And so uh, revenue, obviously, is one of the more important cycles, revenue co uh, collection, as well as expenditures and, and um, disbursements. Uh, acquisitions and disbursements, I should say. So those are the two that we're going to focus on. Obviously, that if you go through your textbook, you'll see that there are other business processes, such as the inventory um, uh, or financing cycle, HR. We're not going to cover those because we just don't have the time to cover all of those different business cycles. But the approach, uh, the audit approach, will be the same. It's just that the accounts that we focus on are going to be different because remember assertions are the same regardless of what business cycle you're looking at. The assertions remain the same. Okay. So with the revenue and collection cycle, basically the accounts that are going to be impacted by the revenue and collection cycle would be the, the accounts in the income statement such as sales um, and uh, the un uh, bad debt expense. Those are going to be the accounts that are impacted. So when you think about um, the accounts, in the, you want to think about, OK, well, what are the transactions that are going to occur in the sales and collection cycle? And what's the impact? And how are those, account, how are those transactions reflected in the financial statements, both the income statement and the balance sheet? So with the accounts in the sales and collection cycle, obviously, when we record a sale, we're going to record that sale in the um, income statement, right, as revenue. Um, and the impact of that sale is that we're going to collect cash or we're going to sell that on account. So let's go with the perspective that we're going to sell on an account, on account, which means that we're going to create an accounts receivable that's reflected in the balance sheet. Um, and so what we should expect, and remember when we talked about fraud, we talked about looking at the accounts and trying to identify unusual journal entries or journal entries that just didn't seem, that seemed out of place. So uh, to be able to do that, you have to know how each account is updated and where that update of information is coming from. So accounts receivable, we expect to see that debits to accounts receivable are going to come directly from the sales journal. So if we're reconciling. Um, debits to the accounts receivable account, we should see that the debits to the accounts receivable account matches what's recorded in our sales journal. The other thing is, uh, the flip side of that, we, you shouldn't see any debits in sales. Why would you not expect to see debits in sales? What's the, what's the, uh, what's the reason for that? Sales? Right. Mm -hmm. Right, there's no, no such thing as a contra asset sale, a contra sale account, right? The, the uh, sale in the income statement, revenue is represented by a debit. The normal balance for a sale account is a credit, I'm sorry, a credit balance, not debit, a credit balance, right? So when you see a debit in the sales account, that should raise a red flag for you. So it's possible that the company could have made an error. Right? And so they had to reverse that sale because they recorded it incorrectly or something like that. But normally you would not expect, you don't want to see a whole bunch of errors in the sales account because that would say that there's a problem with the company's uh, process in, in terms of recording sales, which then should raise a red flag for you. Right? But you would, it would raise a red flag if you saw debits in the sales account. So we're going to see credits in the sales account and the corresponding debit is going to appear in the accounts receivable account. So moving over to accounts receivable on the balance sheet, we expect to see that accounts receivable will have credits. And those credits to accounts receivable should tie directly to the cash receipts journal because that's one, fact, one factor of a credit to a cash receipt, um, sorry, to accounts receivable. The other thing that we expect to see in accounts receivable would be sales returns and allowances. So in other words, if 
um, we allow uh, the client, a customer, to return goods, we have to reduce the accounts receivable because obviously if they return the goods, they no longer owe us the money. So we would see a credit to accounts receivable representing that. Again, we should be able to tie that to the direct entry in the income statement for sales returns and allowances. Right? That is a reduction of your sales. So that's where you see a reduction of sales. Right? Um, and then the other credit that we would expect to see to accounts receivable would be right off of uncollectible accounts. Right? So that's when we make the, the company makes the decision that that receivable is no longer collectible, that they're not going to be able to collect it. That's very different right, from the allowance. So you would see a credit writing that receivable off of the, um, off of, uh, out of accounts receivable. Um, other things that you would see with cash discounts taken, cash in bank, right? So if, uh, you know, we collect on a receivable, we're going to debit um, cash credit uh, accounts receivable. Bad debt expense, on the other hand, deals with the allowance for doubtful accounts. So income statement account uh, being bad debt expense. So when we uh, are reserving for allowance, the allowance for doubtful accounts, we're not going to hit accounts receivable because at the point the company makes the decision to reserve that you're not going to reduce the accounts receivable because you're at that point just saying, you know, there's a possibility we're going, not going to collect on 100% of our receivables. At that point, you don't know which receivable you're not going to collect on, so you couldn't possibly credit accounts receivable. So that's all your financial accounting. So when you decide to write off an account, credit accounts receivable, debit allowance for doubtful accounts or allowance for uncollectible accounts. When you establish the reserve, credit, um, the allowance for uncollectible accounts and debit the bad debt expense. So I go through this overview of your financial accounting knowledge just because it's important to understand the relationships of the account. Because as an auditor, you're going to come in and you're going to look. You're going to expect to see debits and credits to um, accounts receivable, but you, need, you also want to make sure that those debits and credits to accounts receivable make sense. Are we only seeing debits to accounts receivable coming in from the sales journal? You should be able to reconcile those two, or the, the client should have a reconciliation of those two uh, accounts. So when we talk about the sales account, and, and when you talk about any business cycle, you want to think about what are the major functions in that business cycle? What uh, what's happening? What kind of documents would I expect to see? What kind of records am I going to generate? What's the process? What's going on? What kind of transactions occur? And what accounts uh, do those transactions affect? So with the uh, accounts receivable function, I'm sorry, the uh, sales and revenue, uh, sales and collection function, what we're going to see is things like order entry. Right? A customer calls in or a customer sends in a request to, to place an order with the company, that, has to, that order has to be processed. That's what we call the order entry function. Credit authorization, very important, right? Because you don't, if you're selling on an account, on account you want to ensure that you're selling to customers who are able to pay, right? Because if you don't vet your customers and you don't do credit checks, you're selling your goods. You're selling your, uh, uh, you know, uh, shipping your goods um, and once they're out the door, you have no more control over it. Right? You could certainly try to sue the customer for non-payment, but at that point, you've, your inventory is gone. You haven't collected on it. Right? So you want to minimize the, you want to see that the client has controls in place to minimize, uh, you know, bad debts. Shipping um, is important. Why is shipping so important in, in, as a major function? What is it about uh, shipping? That makes it extremely important from a financial reporting perspective. Yes, Omar. Um, like, it could be possible to like fraud or like if they say they did not receive a shipment or um, expenses as far as writing up this thing, uh, false shipment. Right, so uh, fraudulent sales, right? Right. It's tied to the assertion of occurrence, right? So what you're concerned with is Omar pointed out and Ricardo tied to the assertions was 
when you, we look at the audit assertions, occurrence is, a, is what? Occurrence is concerned with overstatement, as, which is what Omar was going, uh, speaking to, right? It's concerned, you're concerned about overstatement. And so you want to know that the amounts that are recorded in the sales journal are tied to actual shipments, meaning they actually occurred. So controls over the shipping process or the shipping function is extremely important. Right? Because that is the way we're going to test the occurrence um, assertion that management makes. Also billing. Right? We don't want things to go out the door and we don't bill our customers. Right? So you want to see if there are controls over billing. Then cash receipts would be the uh, collection process. Uh, accounts receivable, updating the accounts receivable subledger. Um, and uh, then finally the general ledger, making sure that there are proper controls over reconciliation of the amounts recorded in the subledgers that they, uh, in the general ledger, actually agree and reconcile to the amounts recorded in the subledger. The audit evidence then, so the reason that it's important to understand the major functions because you have to determine, okay, well, what audit evidence am I going to collect? Right, so what, what, what are my sources of audit evidence so that I'm able <clears throat> to test management assertions? So you see things such as the pending order master file. <clears throat> so that's, out, that's orders that have been placed, but maybe they have not been shipped yet. Your concern here in looking at that is you want to make sure just because a customer placed an order doesn't mean that it's a sale. Right? So you would want to know from an audit perspective that these items in the pending order master file are not recorded in the sales journal. Because if it's a pending order, you haven't shipped. You only record when you ship. Ricardo. So, so the pending order master file section, um, it, it sure is the sort of, to avoid understatement. But under, um, to avoid overstatement, right? Because if it's a pending order, that means that you haven't, an order is not a sale, right? An order is that I call in and I tell you I'd like to purchase, you know, 100 widgets. It, until you fulfill that order, and fulfilling that order means that the company shipped it, I don't have a sale. I just have an open order. And there's, so no transaction has occurred, right? If, if this if pending means that I didn't ship it, so it's a still open order. So no transaction has occurred, so I should, the, uh, there should be nothing recorded in the books and records uh, in terms of sales or anything, or accounts receivable, because that order has not been placed. And what assertion would relate to, to that? That would be overstatement. You'd, be, you'd look at this, if you saw that, um, you know, if, an order, if the auditor got the um, pending order master file and, you know, just look, took a sample, they would be looking to make sure that none of those orders have been recorded in the sales journal, right? Because it's not a sale. So you look at controls over the pen, uh, 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 the order entry controls, controls over order entry. Other thing would be credit check and approval files, and this is important. Why? Why did I say this was important? Credit check. Yes, Cody. Right. You want to know that you're selling to qualified customers from a credit, credit worthy customers, right? Because if you don't have these controls in place up front, then you increase the chances of selling to customers who are not going to pay you, which is going to manifest itself in, the, in your financial statements, right? Um, because you're going to have higher write-offs. Uh, price list master file, this kind of goes with accuracy. Um, the accuracy assertion because you want to make sure that sales are being made um, and, uh, and customers are being billed in accordance with the company's approved master file um, price list. Sales detail file or what we call the sales journal for obvious reasons it's important um, that all sales that are, you're going to use this is a major um, file that you use in or journal that you use and audit, your audit testing, because you use this to test both the assertions regarding uh, occurrence and completeness. By right? occurrence, you want to make sure that all sales that have been recorded in the sales journal actually occurred. Completeness, uh, that all sales that should be recorded in the sales journal. So in other words, all sales that were shipped, were, um, all shipments 
are reflected in the sales journal. Uh, sales analysis report, uh, that is a report, that, you know, you could use that, and auditors would use that in their analytical procedures uh, to look at, you know, sales by product line, sales by region, uh, sales by month, sales by quarter. So it's, uh, again, important information. Accounts receivable, age trial balance for obvious reason. You use that in your uh, audit of the allowance for doubtful accounts. Cash receipts listing, customer statements. Again, those are important in terms of the, col the collection phase of the business process. So as I told you, assertions never go away. And so again, the assertions are the same regardless. And now we're just going to use those assertions or apply those assertions to the sales and collection cycle. So again, we have assertions about transactions and events, assertions about account balances, and assertions about presentation and disclosure. And so again, here are all of our assertions. Occurrence, um, completeness, accuracy, cutoff, classification. So with the occurrence, again, what we're interested in is ensuring that sales are not overstated. So the auditor here is looking to see that sales um, have been recorded, that have been recorded actually occurred. The, the kinds of controls, so the auditor is going to look at the controls associated with the sales and collection cycles, and they're going to want to see things such as that, uh, that invoices supported by customer purchase orders, Bills of lading, bills of ladings or shipping documents, or other shipping documents exist for all invoices, right? Because you, you want to make sure that your sales are to bona fide customers, right? So your auditor is going to look to see that there are proper controls over the customer master file. That a sale that is recorded has been made to a bona fide customer. It's not enough that it's, just, it's shipped, right? Because you could create a shipping, you could create a false or fictitious customer and ship something to that false or fictitious customer. So it's important to also know that it's, it's a non-fictitious customer. It's a bona fide customer for that company, for the company. Um, so the auditor would test those controls by getting a sample, uh, taking a sample of sales in the detailed sales file and then tying those back to shipping documents, for example. So again, occurrence, you want to make sure that the sales that are recorded in the sales journal actually occurred. So your starting point will be the sales journal, select a sample of sales, and tie those back to supporting documentation, such as the bill of lading. Um, the other thing they would do is vouch the debits from accounts receivable accounts to supporting documentation or sales invoices, for example. Because that would say that the customer, is it a bona fide customer um, of the company? The customer indeed placed this order. So you look at order entry documentation invoices uh, that you, you bill the customer for. Completeness, again, all sales that should be recorded have been recorded. So the auditor's concern here uh, in testing controls will look at invoices, shipping documents, sales orders, they're going to one, want to make sure that they're um, pre-numbered. And pre-numbering is really important because pre-numbering establishes a sequence. So, and, and this will be, and you'll see this when you do, start doing your ACL testing, right? You want to know, that's one way to determine that you have the pop, uh, all, all items in the population. So for example, in ACL, you can run a, a test to see if there are any gaps in the sequence of sales invoices or checks or shipping documents. So, that, so the ACL will go out and look to see if there are any gaps in there and, and return a report of missing documents that the auditor, could, auditor would then follow up on. So you want to establish um, that the, 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 there are no gaps in the sequence. That's one way of establishing completeness. But also, remember, the auditor would then look to see, OK, I know I'm going to select a sample of shipping documents, for example, bills of lading, and tie those back. I'm going to look at those shipping documents and make sure that that sale related to those, that shipment is indeed recorded, recorded in the sales journal. And then uh, things such as accuracy would include credit checks. Uh, you know, uh, I'm sorry, credit sales are approved by the credit department. 
uh, the prices agree to the, price, the, the customers of the company's approved price listing. Um, again, examining the invoices for approval. So example, um, before in, in, in testing the controls regarding ship uh, credit authorization, the auditor might select, select a sample of sales um, or shipments and ensure that there's evidence that it was reviewed by the credit manager. So a signature by the credit manager. They might also look to see if they could run something, uh, use ACL, for example, to run a script to see if, how, to see if there were any shipments or any orders processed when a customer was over their credit limit. So you could set the date range and see if there were any order, orders that were processed for customers over their credit limit. And that's a way of testing whether or not, um, you know, controls are operating effectively. Uh, cutoff, again, relates to ensuring that uh, the items are recorded in the correct period, so sales are recorded in the correct period. So you look at the date on the shipping document and compare that to the invoice date, for example. Uh, classification, ensuring that sales are recorded in uh, the relate, you know, in the right account. So, in other words, sales to customers should be recorded in sales. Other sales would reflect sales uh, made to non-customers, right? So you want to make sure that sales are reflected in the correct account or expenses are reflected in the appropriate account. Any questions? So again, you see how we're using the assertions to develop the audit procedures. So in using, and I, that's why it's important to understand the different functions and how those functions relate to one another, and then the reports and files that are used in testing or gathering evidence so that you can, uh, you'll know what, what documentation is necessary to be able to test management assertions. Um, then we have assertions about accounts balances. So the account balances that are related to the sales and collection cycle would be accounts receivable, cash, the allowance for doubtful accounts. Right? Those are the accounts in the balance sheet relating to the sales and collection cycle. So let's just look at, for example, accounts receivable. Uh, you're making assertions about account balances, so your assertions are existence, accuracy, rights and obligations, completeness, valuation or allocation. So obviously valuation or allocation is going to deal with the allowance for doubtful accounts, and so the auditor is going to perform substantive procedures. And here I want to make a, a, a distinction. When we talk about transactions and events, notice the test that the auditor is performing are a test of controls and test of transactions. Right? That's what they're performing here. They look because your controls are in place, your, your controls are the process that the company has in place to um, ensure that, you know, uh, that any errors or frauds would be detected on a timely basis, right? So, one of the things, if you're testing transactions, your transactions occur the same way all the time. Right? You don't have 15 different ways to record sales. You don't have 15 different processes over sales or, or, or over recording expenses. So if, your control, if, if once you've established that there are controls over the sales process, right, then you're saying that those transactions happen the same way all the time. So if I'm satisfied with the controls related to the sales transactions, then I can just select a sample of transactions, test the controls over those transactions, and be satisfied that uh, sales are uh, proper, right? I mean, I'll do analytical procedures, some analytical procedures and so forth, but basically when you're testing transactions or looking at uh, transactions, you're, you are testing the controls over those transactions. So you, See the term test the transactions, test the controls. So test the transactions and test the controls usually ha happen simultaneously. Whereas with the balance sheet accounts, you're performing substantive procedures, right? Substantive audit procedures. And so, for example, a substantive audit, Ricardo. Okay. So that's what I'm going to do. 
right? So your substantive audit procedure right, is you're testing the details, the account details. And so the, the detail test, so you sometimes see it, it's referred to test the details, test the detail account balances, and so forth. Those are substantive procedures. So for example, with accounts receivable, you want to test that accounts receivable exists, right? Because the fact that you recorded a sale and you've tested sales, right, and you're, you are satisfied with the transactions and controls over the transactions that create revenue. That doesn't, that doesn't tell you anything about the collectability of accounts receivable, right? Or that the accounts receivable exists. So it's not, you cannot just rely on those tests that you perform on sales to satisfy accounts receivable, your test, uh, your ability to conclude on the accounts receivable balance. So substantive procedures would be in, to look at, to ensure that accounts receivable exists the most common procedure, audit procedure, is to confirm. And in fact, it's a required audit procedure. Auditors have to confirm accounts receivable. And if they don't confirm accounts receivable, they have to have a very good reason as to why they don't. Okay? So you're required to confirm accounts receivable. And basically, confirmation of accounts receivable is you select a sample of accounts receivable, and you confirm with the, with the customer directly. The auditor confirms directly with the customer the account balance. If the customer comes back and say, yes, we owe you, we owe XYZ company $100,000, then you've confirmed the account balance. And you've basically said, yes, this accounts receivable exists as of 1231. Right. So is, is it clear to everyone why testing controls and testing transactions will not test to give you evidence about accounts receivable. It will only tell you that that accounts receivable was, a, was, it was valid when it was recorded. But it doesn't tell you anything about the existence of accounts receivable at 1231. So here's a, a question I have you. Let's say the company sold goods to a customer um, on March 31st. 2013. You come in to do the year-end audit and it's, let's say it's February 2014. That accounts receivable is still on the books. What would your conclusion be? Yes, John. Right. It's been almost a year you haven't collected on it. So they're not going to pay. So what would you recommend as the auditor? Hmm? Right. You would recommend that it should be reserved for. You're not going to collect. The client would, you would go to the client and say, this has been outstanding for over a year. Uh, this should be, have you reserved for this? Are you going to collect on this? Right? So at a minimum, you're going to expect that that amount is reserved for in the allowance for doubtful accounts. You might suggest to the client that, you know, question the client as to why they would not write the receivable off or what efforts do they have in place to collect on the receivable. Right. So that, was that a valid accounts receivable? Yep, it was a valid accounts receivable when it was recreated. When it was created uh, in March of 2013. But now the question is, is it collectible? Can we, that's the valuation and allocation. What's the likelihood that the company is going to collect on that accounts receivable? If I'm here as an auditor, February of 2014, and the accounts receivable still hasn't been collected on. Because your normal cycle for accounts receivable was probably about 30 days, right? Most companies will extend credit to their customers for maybe 30 days. So confirm a sample of accounts receivable and perform follow-up procedures. And the follow-up procedures that you're going to perform with accounts receivable is, one, you're going to confirm it. If the customer sends the accounts receivable confirmation back saying, great, yes, we owe them, our records show that we owe them 100%, check it off, it agrees. The customer might not send it back. What do you think you do if the customer doesn't send it back? If they don't confirm the accounts receivable, what do you think your options are as an auditor? Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
Yeah, you have to perform all the tests, right? You can't just say, oh, the cu customer didn't confirm, so I'm going to pick a different customer and confirm that customer. It's not pick and replace, right? Can't do that. You selected that in your sample. You have to follow up on it. So you have to perform alternative procedures. And those alternative procedures would involve you looking at subsequent cash receipts. Because remember, you're confirming as of 1231 if that's the company's year end. You're looking at the accounts receivable balance as of year end. So really, if you're coming in a couple of months, three months after year, after year end, the likelihood of it is that that accounts receivable should have been collected. Right? That they, they, might have had, they, might have, they might have cash collections against that accounts receivable at 1231. I mean, as of the audit date. So you would look at subsequent cash collections. Or you would, quest, you would look at whether or not uh, the company's going to, you know. Uh, or you can get a, a, a um, confirmation back where the client, the customer says, no, we don't owe 100000 we owe 80000 So that is, a, a, you're not going to send another confirmation and say, oh, no, we say 100 why is it 80 You're going to follow up on what's the $20,000 difference between what's recorded and what was confirmed. So those, that's what we mean by follow-up procedures. Um, you're also concerned about the, the uh, accounts receivable is accurate, so that's just a matter of, you know, what creates accounts receivable is sales. So you tie uh, the accounts receivable information back to the, the original sales invoice or uh, and shipping documents. Rights and obligations, you're going to look, uh, you want to ensure that management actually has the rights to the, uh, to the um, accounts receivable that they've recorded, that they haven't factored accounts receivables or sold their accounts receivable to a third party. So in that case, you, that information has to be approved by the board. Normally that's going to be a board action. Um, you would look at board of director minutes. You would ask the client, management inquiry, ask the client, have you sold or factored any accounts receivable? Look at documentation. Um, if they have sold or factored accounts receivable, look at the contracts related to that. So those are the procedures that they would perform. You would also see sometimes, too, by looking at the bank confirmations during your bank, when you confirm the bank uh, account, cash account balances, uh, part of that confirmation asks, are there any loans or liens or, that the, the bank has um, with the company? So then you'd look to see if there's any indication that would suggest that the company has factored um, accounts receivable. Completeness is all receivables that should be recorded, have been recorded, and when you perform the sales cutoff test, that'll give you information about uh, accounts receivable, uh, the completeness of accounts receivable. Um, another thing you can do is include a sample of zero balances in your confirmation account, right? So if you, uh, from your accounts receivable subledger, right, you could just send to the, uh, you know, customer, uh, asking them to confirm the, their account balance as of 1231. And if the customer comes back and basically says, you know, yeah, oh yeah, we owe $500, but the, custom, the client is saying uh, it's zero, that's, that means that you would follow up on that, and maybe the client forgot to record an accounts receivable. So you could do that as well. And then valuation and allocation obviously deals with whether accounts receivable are recorded at its net realizable value. So here you're going to test the age trial balance. You're going to look at um, whether or not uh, the aging that the company has and the amount that the company has recorded for allowance for doubtful accounts is appropriate. Um, you'd also look at uh, any write-off. Right, write-offs that the company's engaged in. Also, when you're doing your planning phase, you're going to gather information about the customers, the company's customers, uh, any major customers. If there's been a change in how they, their customer base, right? Um, for example, if they've moved from, uh, you know, maybe selling to a lot of smaller clients to selling to much larger clients, how might that change? How how might that change your allowance? How you look at the allowance for doubtful accounts? A, a lot of small clients versus several major large clients. How might that impact your assessment? So let's say the company changes its customer mix. So they've moved from selling to a lot of little small, little small, little small business type customers to larger uh, companies. 
corporations. How might it affect the way you assess uh, the allowance? Well, you have to obviously assume that your silver, you're going to sell one product or whatever. Maybe, maybe. Mm-hmm. Maybe expect an increase in AR. So it could be an increase in AR, but how and how might that impact allowance, though? Victoria. Okay, so, and how would that affect your, how you view allowance for Dow collectability? Sure. Yes. Um, when it decreases, it will affect the allowance on the cost Right. So, you, so you, it, you would probably see more uh, um, of a decrease in your allowance, right? Because larger customers, as you pointed out, Victoria, they're, they're engaging in a lot more transactions, but they're paying, right? Bigger transactions, they're paying. They usually have systems in place where they're paying on a regular basis. Less chance of bankruptcy, per se, right? When you have larger clients, corporations, because they're not, you know, uh, your business is not so, so, such a, a huge part of their business, right? Because they're large corporations. So that would probably result in a, a, a change in how you would uh, reserve. You'd probably see less, uh, a smaller allowance for doubtful accounts or a lower reserve for uh, uncollectible accounts in that case. The other hand, the other risk though, is when you, if you have a lot of small clients, the loss of one client doesn't really, a customer I should say, doesn't really impact the business as much because you have a lot of small clients. Where, but however, the risk is greater when you have your business is concentrated with very few major companies, right? Because if you lose that company or you lose that business, that can have a tremendous impact on your sales. But also if that company goes bankrupt, then that has a tremendous impact on your accounts receivable and your ability to collect. You're probably not going to collect on it. Right? So it, it has its, it, you, an auditor has to consider both sides of that when they're evaluating the account, um, the allowance for doubtful accounts. Any questions of, so far about su t uh, substantive procedures and tying those to the assertions? Okay. So let's just kind of go through the key steps um, in our audit approach and designing the audit approach, right? And so I'm going to take you back. We're going to talk a little bit about planning, right? So obviously the first thing you're going to do, steps one and two, involves your preliminary planning, right? Your audit planning and you're in the planning stage. You're identifying the client business risk. You're looking at the industry and the external environment, looking at what, is, what are management's objectives and what are the business processes and how do they affect the financial statements, right? So that's there. You're probably going to do some preliminary analytical, you're not going to probably, you, you are going to do some preliminary analytical procedures, right, to identify where there are potential risks. So in this case, we're looking at the, uh, sales and collection cycle. So in your analytical procedures, you're in your planning phase and you perform some analytical procedures, you're looking at, let's say, you're looking at sales for the current year versus sales for the previous year and you see that sales are on a decline. Like sales have declined and uh, then you, what, what, does, what might that tell you? Sales have declined. What information do you get from that other than sales decline? What's, what's the risk here? What are some potential risks, seeing a decline in sales? And let's just say that it's not consistent with industry. Industry sales are stable. John. So if the sales are, if, if the decline is significant enough that it, it's impacting their ability, um, their, their cash flow, right, their operations, then going concern might be an issue. So that's something that you would have uh, in your, your mind as an auditor. What, uh, what else? We 
So you might look and say, you might ask, is some, uh, you know, uh, is there is this a sales decline because um, there might be fraud going on? Is, are the, what is this, you know, what's going on with controls? You know, how effective are controls? Has there been any change in the internal controls? What other risk? Sales are declining, but the industry is stable. What about inherent risk? What are some of the factors? No takers? Victoria. Right. You might consider, it's like, oh, sales are declining in industry, you know, they're in a competitive industry. The industry sales are stable. So, you know, does this create an environment where management might want to, would be more uh, uh, apt to manage earnings, right? Because they're trying to keep pace with prior year numbers and keep pace with the industry. So in here again is what will, if, 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 uh, if there's a greater incentive to manage earnings perhaps, what are the controls around the tone at the top um, and internal controls in general to prevent or detect that on a timely basis. So those are the things. So your analytical procedures, you're not saying that fraud occurred, you're not saying that there's not a legitimate reason for sales to decline, but it raises an area where there's potential risk that you'd look at. Another analytical procedure you might perform would be that sales are staying with sales are declining and you're looking at the relationship of accounts because that, that's an analytical procedure that you would perform. You see sales declining but accounts receivable is growing. What's your risk? You know the relationship between accounts receivable and sales. Does that relationship make sense to you? I heard a yes. Why does it make sense? Right, but sales is grown, accounts receivable is grown. So right, you're, you're, you, you hit part of it, right? Your sales are going down, but I'm seeing accounts receivable go out, go up. We sell on credit. We're not collecting cash, right? So we're not collecting on our accounts receivable. Because if, if it's accounts receivable to go up, and it, it's okay for it to go up, it either means that the company's extended or change their credit granting policy. So in other words, they're allowing their customers to take a longer time to pay. I don't know if that's such a great business practice. Or that they're not collecting on their accounts receivable. Jimmy. Well, you would kind of know that, right? You would know that going in, right? But still, even if it's mergers and acquisitions, right? You still have, a, so you still pick up the sales from the merger, right? or the acquisition. So this, the relationship between accounts, between accounts receivable and sales should, pretty, should survive that, right? Because you would expect to see, it would still, you know, you could say, yeah, they acquired another company and that company was, and maybe it is that company, they got that company really cheap because that company uh, was mismanaged or was losing money, they purchased them, so they took on these bad accounts receivable right, because there was something else attractive about that company. So that's quite possible, but it still doesn't change the relationship between sales and accounts receivable that, you know, there's a potential problem when you see sales are going down but accounts receivable are going up, right. So you're going to want to look into that. And so when you look into that, you might find that the, the company had, a, 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 you know, acquired a company and this was the characteristics of the company and this is why we're seeing that, that trend. Right? But it's the point of it is that at this point you're looking at preliminary analytical procedures to identify where the potential risk is. Um, other things, uh, again, we're in the planning stage, you're going to set the tolerable misstatement and assess inherent risk, right? So um, you want to look at what it, what's, as it pertains to sales and collection cycle, what, what's our inherent risk here? What are the factors? that would cause the auditor to increase inherent risk or assess inherent risk as high. Um, you know, receivables is generally going to be one of the more significant accounts on the financial statements. Um, 
You have to think about what's going on in the company, what's going on with the industry, right? Those things are important. You have to know, um, again, consider SAS 99, consider fraud risk, right? If in one example, someone uh, responded to that, you know, maybe the fact that the, we're seeing that the company's in a, uh, a declining sales trend, that that creates greater incentive for management. Maybe management is feeling under pressure. Um, so they're more, they're more likely to try to manage earnings. And then you, your question would be, well, where are they, where will they be able to manage earnings in that scenario? In the sales and collection cycle. You know, can, what, where, are they, where is it more susceptible to earnings management? Allowance for doubtful accounts, right? Because that's the account that, uh, that is very judgment based, right? The, uh, you, uh, you don't know with certainty which account is going to go bad. You don't know with certainty which account you're going to have to eventually write off. So all of it is based on judgment. Another thing could be cutoff errors. Cutoff errors are more subjective, but if controls are not, I'm sorry, cutoff errors are more objective. Cutoff by itself is more objective, right? Did you, did you ship the goods on 1230 before or on 1231? Yes, then you, can, you should record a sale, right? You should. But if you didn't, you shouldn't record it. If it did not go leave your premises uh, until after 1231, until after year end, you shouldn't record a sale. That's very cut and dry. But if there are lax controls around cutoff, around shipment, then cutoff errors become even more significant, right? So you want to look at where they can manage the earnings. Um, with respect to the inherent risk assessment related to the sales and collection cycle, again, you want to think about how these four factors impact the revenue process or the sales and collection process. How does the in what are the industry-related factors? Right? Is it a very competitive industry? Is the, is the company um, in a situation where um, one of their competitors came out with a blockbuster product? Are they in a situation where their product is coming off patent and so that they have to now deal with a lot of competition from their industry, uh, from their competitors? Um, you also want to think about the complexity of the transactions in the sales and collection cycle. How complex and how context contentious are revenue recognition issues? So, you know, in, in most of the examples, in all of the examples that I've you so far with respect to revenue, I've talked about this idea of shipping. If we can trace it to a shipping document and the shipping document shows that this item was shipped before 1231 or on 1231, then it's a valid sale. Well, you don't, all sales don't work that way, right? Because you have sales that are, are um, related to contracts where certain elements have to be performed for that contract, for the contract uh, to be fulfilled, right? So for the revenue to be recognized. Those are more complex transactions where the revenue recognition isn't as straightforward. Um, the difficulty of auditing transactions in the account balance, right? And so those types of contentious or difficult revenue recognition issues means that it's more difficult to audit the transactions because sometimes there's judgment involved in terms of when it's completed or, or whether or not the client has sufficiently satisfied all elements of the contract um, that would allow them to record the revenue. And then finally, uh, a history of misstatements. So do we have, we've seen in the past that there are a lot of misstatements associated with this particular account or accounts. Some, uh, some things would be improper revenue recognition, such as cutoff issues. Bill and hold issues where you bill the customer and then try so that you can record the sale and then hold the goods. Well, that's not good, right? Billing, which is why billing should not be the reason that you record a sale, right? You want to look at whether or not those items actually left the company's premises. And then channel stuffing is where companies will make side deals with their customers and just basically say, you see at year end, you know, or on or around your end, all of these goods going out. They're just selling like crazy, right? Because they've made a side deal with the customer that, yeah, just get it out here and we'll let you return it. If you don't sell it, you, you can return it. Those are side deals. And so what you're going to look for then is one way to, to look at that or try to detect that 
is that you'll see those, if you see a high level of returns coming in after your rent. So one of, your audit, one of the audit procedures you're going to see performed is they look at returns and allowances after year rent. They look at the level of returns. It's not unusual for a company to have returns, but you shouldn't expect to see a high level of returns. Um, other things would be related to uh, the allowance for doubtful accounts. Um, obviously because of the judgment related to that. Um, once you've done that, the next step is to assess your control risk. So you're going to look at, again, what are the controls that we would expect to see around the revenue cycle? What's critical? Obviously, you have to have a segregation of duties. So you want to identify what are the key con internal controls and what, if any, deficiencies have, uh, have we found in the past. Um, and look at those deficiencies and associate them with your audit objectives and then assess what the control risk is for each objective. So for example, you want to ensure that there, and the auditor is going to definitely want to see that there are effective controls over the shipping process and recording of revenue, right? So the objective here is you want to ensure that there is, uh, that the, the possibility for overstatement of sales is mitigated and that there are controls in place to prevent or detect it on a timely basis. So the auditor is going to look for controls around shipping to be able to satisfy the occurrence uh, assertion. Some key controls, as I said, would be segregation of duties, separation of duties. You, again, remember separation of duties is that there are controls in place to ensure that no one person can uh, perpetrate and then conceal a fraud. Or, or, or make an error and conceal that error. Other things would be authorization of transactions. You want to see authorization of write-offs. You don't want someone to just arbitrarily be able to go in and write off an accounts receivable because by writing off accounts receivable, you're removing an asset. So the company has lost an asset. Um, any kind of electronic data interchange in terms of transactions, credit checks prior to the approval for sale. So prior to processing <coughs> an order, that the, you're, you ensure that the customer uh, meets the company's uh, credit standards. Uh, pricing, that the goods are being sold or customers are being sold at a price consistent with the company's documents, um, I'm sorry, procedures. Um, access to assets, right? You want to make sure that some, you're protecting or safeguarding your assets so people shouldn't just have, you know, there should be controls over who has access to checks who has access to um, shipping, or inventory, things like that, that there are adequate documents and records, as I talked about the importance of pre-numbered documents, um, independent checks on performance, and that's basically that um, there are reconciliation procedures going on, and those reconciliation procedures are being reviewed and approved. So when we talked about segregation of duties um, on Wednesday, we did a, a short case. But with the, typically what you'll see is a segregation of duties matrix. And what you'll see is for each cycle or business process, and in this case we're talking about a revenue and accounts receivable functions, you look at the major functions in that cycle. And in this case it's order entry, credit, shipping, accounts receivable, cash receipts, IT, remember IT on a segregation of duties chart, and the treasurer, right, really dealing with um, you know, the person who's responsible uh, for overall uh, the cash, right? So you would then, along that line, list the different departments and then, I mean, across the columns, list the different departments and then in the rows, list the different procedures <coughs> that are being performed uh, or functions. So receiving and preparing the customer order, approving the credit, shipping goods to customers. So all of the steps that are involved in processing a revenue transaction. Right, and recording that transaction through the collection of that transaction, of, of, that, uh, of, of the cash, as well as the consideration of the allowance for doubtful accounts. And you, again, remember, you want to make sure that there's a proper segregation of duties so that, for example, a, a person who has custody of an asset, such as cash, doesn't also have the responsibility for updating accounts receivable. Right? They shouldn't have the ability to write off accounts receivable for example.
So that's what we call a uh, segregation of duties matrix. So when you think about segregation of duties, important step to take is to identify the departments or the functions involved and then identify the steps in that process. Make sure that it, those things are properly, those functions are properly segregated. Other controls that you would expect to see in place with respect to uh, this cycle is that no sales order without a customer order. Right? So this is a way of um, making sure that you're only processing orders for valid, uh, processing sales for valid customer orders. Right? And uh, you would also want to make sure that the order when you process an order for a customer, that that customer is a valid customer. So in other words, the customer is in the company's customer master file. You shouldn't be able to process orders for customers who are not in the customer master file, and there should be controls over adding customers to the customer master file. Uh, we already talked about the importance of credit approval. Uh, you also want to make sure that there's restricted access to inventory. So a lot of times you'll see in plants, uh, or, or warehouses that, you know, sometimes you'll have to go through a security gate. They'll check, you know, for highly sensitive and, and, and or very expensive products, you know, companies will, you know, won't allow you to bring bags in or, you know, the, or they check your bags on your way when you're leaving the, the premises, right? So they want to make sure that they're, they're restricting access to inventory. Um, and, uh, because obviously inventory is an asset. Restricted access to terminals and invoices, right? So that's why you see most times you have to have a login, right? You, uh, so they're going to, one, make sure that they have, a, uh, they have a, a trace or be able to track who's logging into the system and ensure that only people who are authorized to log into the system can. So that's your login ID and your password. Um, also, it, you want restricted access to documents, right? So you, you shouldn't just leave invoices out that anyone could grab a hold of an invoice and process it, right? Because that person could then um, take an invoice and, and create a, a situation where a, a fictitious uh, customer is uh, or an unauthorized invoice is processed through the system. Uh, you want to make sure that uh, all the documentation that is necessary to record a sale is, is kept together. So for example, what did we say? You, can't, you shouldn't record a sale without there being an accompanying uh, bill of lading, without there being um, an, a, a, a valid order for a, a valid customer. Right? So in that case, in, if, if as an auditor, if I'm going to test sales, I want to see, one, if there's a bill of lading, I want to see the customer order, the order entry form, because I want to know that it is a, a valid customer that's in the company's customer master file. I expect to see evidence on that, um, that order that from the credit approving the, uh, uh, the sale in the sense of proving that the customer has, uh, has been granted credit and they haven't uh, exceeded their authorized credit limit. So that's what I mean by all of the documentation recorded that is properly dated. We know that's, that's important because that is how we test the cutoff. Um, that invoices are being compared to the bill of ladings and the orders, and that's a part of just that all of the documentation uh, to record that sale is kept together, and that the pending order file has been reviewed. So the company should be reviewing the pending order file because a pending order suggests that um, uh, either there's inefficiencies in your, your process of processing customer orders or that you have out of stock, right? You, you have a lot of back orders because you don't have the inventory in stock. That again could, could say, could, could cause a red flag. Why isn't the company, you know, why, why are they processing orders or taking orders for inventory if they don't have the, the inventory to meet? Uh, the customer demand, which could cause them problems down the line with a customer. Because if you're constantly back ordering with a company, you're going to find, a, as a customer, you're going to find a different supplier. And then uh, the next step is now we've done our planning, we've tested controls, now it's time, uh, or we've, uh, we've reviewed controls or assessed controls. So now we're in the process of performing the test of controls, right? So with controls, when an auditor, in the planning phase, the auditor is assessing the control risk. As a part of assessing control risk, they're looking 
at the controls that management has in place and determining whether or not those controls are effective. That's by doing walkthroughs, um, that's by management inquiry, um, you know, so the, the auditor is getting a sense of the types of controls that the company has in place. But now you have to ensure that those controls are working, right, that, the, that they're operating the way that they've been described. So you're going to test those controls by taking a sample um, of transactions and testing the controls around those transactions. And that's what we mean by substantive tests of controls and substantive tests of transactions. And so, um, again, when we're looking at the sales and revenue cycle, we're going to look at what are the various accounts in that cycle, um, and then look at the assertions related to the sales and, tr trans sales and um, uh, I'm sorry, the transactions and events, in this case sales, um, and then uh, controls around the account balances. Um, when the auditor performs and tests their controls, Again, they're inspecting documents and records. They're talking to management. They're observing how those controls are wor working, and they're re-performing those controls. That's what they do to assess control risk. Um, and then with control, when they, after they assess those controls, the control risk, then they test those controls. I'm going to skip through this. So in the objective of testing those controls, right, and is determining is how much reliance you can place on those controls. Because the more reliance that you can place on controls, the more you're going to rely on your test of controls, you're going to reduce your substantive testing. You're going to reduce the amount of substantive testing that you have to perform, right? Because basically what you're saying, control, if I can rely on controls, they operate the same way. The, a sales transaction has the same effect on the income statement and the balance sheet if I record one sale versus if I record a thousand sales, right? Each time I'm going to credit sales and debit accounts receivable. When I collect on those, uh, those accounts receivable, I'm going to credit accounts receivable and debit cash. It operates the same way. So let's uh, stop here and I want to, let's take a look at problem 560. And test the details, right? So substantive tests, yeah, details, which is test the controls. Mm -hmm. So it's three, three. Right. So you have you have test the controls, you have substantive uh, procedures. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And the right. And you have test the transactions. Okay. Right. Which is usually done. That's what's meant by dual purpose test. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. What does the, that mean? Um, yeah. So that means that when they're doing that, they're they're kind of taking money from, that you've stolen money. So now what you're doing is to, to try to delay um, the revelation that you've stolen that money, right? Is that you're taking accounts receivable from one account, like when the cash is collected, applying it to another account, and you just keep doing that. So because what'll happen is, um, it's a timing effect, right? So it, it, the, you won't find it out until a customer actually you, you don't apply it to an account and a customer complains, okay. you know. So what you're doing is stealing from one account's receivable to pay off another account's receivable and you just keep okay. like, doing that until okay. you get, you know, because eventually it's going to get caught, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. You're welcome.
So just so we could kind of expedite this, just tell me, for each audit test, instead of going through the type of audit test, just, uh, I'll cover that, but I want you to tell me the assertion that's being tested, okay? So just so we could expedite it, just focus on uh, the assertion being tested with that particular audit test. Okay, I know you haven't gotten through all of them, but I, I want to get uh, kind of reconvene here. So let, let's, um, with respect to audit tests, right, the types of tests. So you have test of controls, right, and you have substantive tests. Under substantive tests, you have three different types of tests. You have test of transactions, test of details, and analytical procedures. We call them substantive analytical procedures, right? You have three different types of tests. Normally, in, within an audit environment, when you're testing controls, you're also, you can also test uh, transactions, substantive tests of transactions. And that involves the testing of uh, items in the income statement for the most part, right? Because you're testing, transactions are, are, are recorded in the income statement, and then they, imp they impact amounts recorded in the balance sheet. So you will normally see tester controls and tester transactions being performed uh, simultaneously. So in s certain instances, testing a control also t uh, provides you evidence about that transaction. And that's what we call a dual purpose test. Okay, does that make sense? So two t you have tester controls and you have substantive and you have substantive testing. And under substantive testing, you have test of transactions, substantive test of transactions, 
substantive test of detail balances, and substantive analytical procedures. Tests of controls and substantive tests of transactions usually occur simultaneously. Right? And the reason I say usually is because if you can't rely on controls, you're not going to test controls. And what will happen is you're going to perform more tests of transactions and you're just going to increase your sample size. You're going to increase the scope of testing that you do. But it normally under uh, situations where you can rely on internal controls, you're going to perform tests of transactions and test the controls simultaneously. And most times, and there are many instances where your testing controls will also provide you evidence about the transactions. So that's what we call a dual purpose test. Make sense? OK. So the first one, what's the uh, assertion being tested here? You're vouching recorded sales invoices to supporting shipping documents. What are you testing? What you, what do you, what do you, when you do this, you will know what? Right. That it occurred. You're testing occurrence. Right? You're going from the shipping to, I'm sorry, you're going from sales to shipping. So you want to make sure that what's recorded in the, in, what's recorded in the sales journal actually occurred. So you're testing occurrence. And we would consider this a dual purpose test because you're testing controls over to ensure that for items recorded in the sales journal, there's a corresponding shipping document. So you're, you're testing controls over the uh, recording of sales, but you're also gathering information about the validity of the sales, right? Of, of what was recorded in the sales journal. So you're getting information about that account balance, about that transaction balance. Make sense? Okay. Let's move to the next one. What would you say this is? What's your assertion here? You're looking at the recorded sales invoices for credit approval. Why does, what will you know once you perform this? This is going to tell you something about what? Credit approval tells us why do we approve? Expect to see credit approval. Just like you mentioned pretty much with the uh, uh, company's credit. Right. Bad debts, right? You want to know that you're minimizing, you want to know that the company has procedures in place to minimize uh, uncollectible accounts. Right? And that deals with what? What assertion are we? You don't know if it's accurate. David, you were going to say? Right. See, the, it, it, it's not accuracy because at this point you don't know. First of all, valuation is it's, it's valuation. But allowance for doubtful accounts is a balance, is right, balance sheet. Right? So you lo you're looking at the valuation because if, if the company is not uh, making, um, if the company is making uh, sales to customer, customers who are not credit worthy, it's going to manifest itself in the allowance for doubtful accounts, right? Because you're going to see that the, if you're not credit worthy, you're not paying. So your allowance for doubtful accounts is probably going to increase. That's a balance sheet. You're, it's a valuation. So you're concerned about the valuation of, of accounts receivable at that point. And this is your inspecting records. Uh, re you're expecting recorded sales invoices for credit approval. That's a control. Credit approval is a control, one of our control procedures, right? Remember? There it is, credit approval, right? That's a control. So that's a test of controls. So you're testing the controls designed to ensure that sales are not processed for customers who, are, who don't have proper credit approval or who aren't credit worthy. So, so the next one is vouching the recorded sales invoice prices to the approved price list. So you're, you're vouching what's recorded in the sales journal 
the, 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 the price that's included on the sales invoice um, for that sale that's in the sales journal to the approved price list. It's the accuracy assertion. Well, it's not dual at that point because you don't know at this point you don't know anything about the balance. It's a test of control, so you're partly right, right? But you don't know anything about the account balance by doing that, right? You just know that the price on the sales invoice matches the price in the in the um, the price list, the approved price list. That's all you know. You don't know if they recorded the right quantity, right? That's why you don't know if it's an the amount is accurate, right? That's why I'm not not accurate. That's why you don't know anything about the balance. You just know that the invoice, the amount, the the price in the invoice matches the uh, price list. That's it. That's all you know. So that's accuracy, and it's a test of controls. Does that make sense, everybody? Okay. So remember that we did this earlier when we talked about, one second, when we talked about examining assertions, it's what will I know after I perform this audit procedure? What will it tell me? And that's how you think about what assertion you're testing, Ricardo. So the reason why it's not such a substantive test is because since the planning test test sort of account details and this thing is going to give us any information about it. It doesn't tell you anything about the account balance. <coughs> substantive test is going to give you some information about the account balance, right? And so this doesn't, this test by itself does not give you any information about the account balance. It just gives you information about the components of, uh, uh, or, the, uh, or, uh, or bits of information about the details of that, uh, that receivable, I'm sorry, um, sales invoice. Okay. Let's do one more and then we'll break. Uh, so this, the uh, send confirmations to all customers regarding accounts receivable. What, t what controls are you testing? Because you, 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 you're not testing a process. You, in this case, as an auditor, you're sending a confirmation to accounts to your customers. It's, um, it's existence, right? Remember, accounts receivable, because what you're trying to, so, the, the, so let's back up. The, the assertion that you're testing, anytime you're sending a confirmation, you're testing existence. You don't know if it's complete, right? Um, that's not going to, that'll only tell you completeness about that particular accounts receivable, but it doesn't tell you anything about the completeness of accounts receivable in general, right? So it, it, it's not complete. When you send a confirmation, you're testing existence. You're trying to determine, does this, did, does this accounts receivable exist as of 1231, right? That's all that tells you. Now, with respect to the type of test, it's a, you're testing an account balance. It's giving you information about the account balance, right? By confirming that particular, by, by confirming accounts receivable, you're gathering information about the appropriateness of the accounts receivable balance. You're gathering evidence about the accounts receivable balance. So it's a substantive test of details, or a substantive, it's a substantive test, and specifically it's a substantive test of account balances or details. Okay, so we're going to finish up this problem. We'll, we'll pick this up again on, um, on Wednesday.